is global climate change real? We are asking this question at the end. There are three different ways we can try to answer that question. One, by theory. Two, by observation. Three, by model. Well, by theory, we know that there is greenhouse effect. The Earth is warm because the greenhouse gas surrounding us, surrounding the Earth, will be able to help us trap the heat, trap the solar energy within the atmosphere. So we could be warm. Without the atmosphere covered with greenhouse gas, the Earth will be frozen. Nothing is going to be able to survive. It's critical and essential to have greenhouse gas. However, we are having too much of greenhouse gas. So in theory, with too much greenhouse gas, we're trapping too much heat. And that is an indication of climate change. So is it getting hotter? We think it is. It is getting hotter. <coughs> and if you look at the actual observation of temperature, it is getting hotter. There's no question that we get warmer and warmer temperature. And most of the hot days on record are within the past several years. So if you look at Jersey, Jersey only, global average was showing on the previous graph, and that might be too far away from us. Now let's look at our home state. So in Jersey, you also show an upward trend. The temperature has been going up. And now we are talking about a much smaller area, not the entire globe. Well, the rapid warming has happened since the 1980s. And you can see that fluctuation that is still going on upward trend. 2014 was the hottest year on record. 2015, as it is now, still trying to be the hottest one out in the 2014. Another indication telling us the observation is showing us climate change, warming is happening. Well, so if we get warmer, what happens? When you have warmer, that means more water got evaporated from the Earth and go into the atmosphere. We have more water particle in the atmosphere. Warmer temperature will also create more precipitation, so more water will rain down. Well, again, warmer train that we're experiencing. Well, that also is coherent with what we have been seeing in terms of precipitation. More water has been <coughs> rained down onto Earth. And in Jersey alone, look at that blue line. It is going up. Sea level rise is another indication about global climate change. Uh, the purple line, that over on the graph, at the bottom, is actually global sea level level, uh, sea level. So if you see the global sea level, that green, that purple line, it is going up. And the blue and green on the top is the sea level measurement of the state of New Jersey. It's much more rapid compared to the global train. And one of the reasons is the Jersey coast is subsiding into the ocean. So we are losing our coast area into the ocean. So the two effect compound, we are losing more, and the sea level already is much rapier than the rest of the globe. If we use model, Okay, we talk about theory, we talk about observation. But there are models out there to predict that what is going to be the sea level in the future. So there are two different, uh, three different models here that we're presenting. Uh, one is with lower indication, lower change. One is higher change, and what we consider the best. So if you look at that left column, 2015 and 2100 are the two years that we use for projection destination. So if we look at just the one that say the best model, by 2050, which is only 35 years from now, and we can all probably live that long to see it, 1.3 feet of sea level rise is what we're expecting. 2100, maybe we won't see it, 
maybe some of you well, we're expecting about 3 feet of sea level rise. And the worst one, by 2100, we might lose 5 feet into the ocean. What does that mean? <coughs> okay, because 1 feet, 2 feet, exactly what is that? When we put it into the <coughs> mat context, this is Seaside High, as some of you might be familiar with the area. It's a coastal community with only one foot of water on your very left side. Some area has already turned purple, which means that that area is going to be inundated in water. So that's only by like 2040, 25 years from now. By 2090, we're expecting the area to be three feet under the water. So look at three feet. A lot of area has turned purple, right? Mm -hmm. By 2100, six feet, seaside high is majority of the area are underwater. But this is only sea level at a regular situation, not counting high tide events, not counting any stony depth. So even without one foot on your very left, if you have a high tide, if you have a rainy dam, if you have a stony dam, the whole area could be inundated in water. So that's a projection based on the most advanced and well accepted model. So is the climate change actually happening? Through series, through observation, through model, we all conclude that, yeah, it's really likely that it is happening and humans are responsible. Like we say, greenhouse gas is probably one of the major reasons. And in the future, we expect the sea level rise to continue, and we expect the temperature to keep going up. There will be more precipitation and more extreme climate events, such as storms, such as drought, such as flooding. It is going to happen in our future. So unfortunately, it's to be expected. We have to be prepared. We ask ourselves a lot of questions. Will my family be safe if there's another event? Will my property be flooded? Should I buy flood insurance? Should I cut a tree down in my backyard? Should I, what do I do to be prepared? Well, some of them are easy to answer. I could tell you straightforward. You don't have to cut down your tree in your backyard. And the tree are not causing the flooding. Don't joke about it because those are the questions that got flooded a lot after Sandy. The tree down in my backyard, that must be the reason cause flooding. No, trees are not causing the flooding. But some of them are much more difficult to answer and that's why governments step in and try to help. So after Sandy, the government provided a long list of action uh, and assistance. They try to clean out the beach um, they try to assess the damage and they try to help the homeowner to remodel their house to be more <coughs> resilient to stone event. They are buyout program to help the property owner they are at the flooding area to evade to other places. And we also try to protect our critical infrastructures such as town hall, hospital, school, police station. Okay, so in Jersey, September 20, well, that doesn't sound <coughs> like the right year. I must have typo here. In 2013, government uh, office actually established this what they call Office of Flood Hazard Risk Reduction Measures. And then we see HUD money. HUD is the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So there are money available to help New Jersey to be more prepared and also to repair the same damage. So a couple of things that was help money actually help us, such as you will help buy out property that would be flooded if next flood or next stone count. Or it will help the municipality, the town, to be better prepared, such as have a backup generator, have a pumping station that can pump the water away from your area to protect their critical infrastructure, like I say, hospitals, uh, fire station or firehouse or uh, like police station. And there was a lot of money coming to the state of New Jersey. There's also a lot of money um, going into New York as well. So for example, 
There were $4.2 billion <coughs> Sandy Community Development Block Grant that came to Jersey, and 8.6 go to New York. Then additionally, FEMA also gave Jersey $1.7 billion, and in New York, $7.7 .7 billion. There's a graph here. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware. There is a huge discrepancy between how much New Jersey got and how much New York got. Anybody know <coughs> why New Jersey got significant less amount of money than New York? Okay. So, in order to receive federal assistance, we have to provide matching. So, in other, way, uh, other words to say it is, if we want $1 from FEMA, we have to provide some as matching for FEMA to release the money. <laughs> Typical situation is about 25%. So, we want $100 from FEMA. We have, the New Jersey government has to match 25 and in this case, because the stone was so <coughs> devastating, FEMA actually lowered down the matching amount to 10%. So if you want $100 from FEMA, the state only had to pay 10%. Unfortunately, Trenton was in a very bad financial situation even before Sandy. So we were not able to come up with enough matching money to receive enough money from FEMA. And New York, on the opposite, across Hudson, were able to come up with more money to get a matching fund. So there's a huge discrepancy. I want to point out, not to like point finger at the Christie governor or whatever, but that was one of the reasons that we were receiving a, a significant portion less of assistance from the federal compared to New York. So one thing that HUD also do is started this competition called Rebuild by Design. And Rebuild by Design aims to connect design, funding, and impl implementation all together for a more holistic approach, a more integrated plan. There were six winning proposals, four of them in the state of New York and two in New Jersey all at places that receive the most damage. Two of them in New Jersey, one in the Meadowland, and the other one in Hoboken. I will go into each of the program a little bit. So the one in Hoboken is called Resist, Delay, Store, Discharge, a comprehensive strategy for Hoboken. I read the name out loud, it's very long, but I want to point out the reason is comprehensive. Like I say, we can't just plot a plot here when the water is coming. We can't just try to deal with one pothole at a time. What we really need is a holistic approach. Look at the whole area. Have an integrated management plan. So that word comprehensive here really is a key word I want to point out to you. So HUD actually approved and allowed to release the money back in April of this year for a total money that I will show you in just a bit. But NGDP, Department of Environmental Protection, is in charge of the task to design and implement uh, the final program. So the timeline here. Here we go. Although the money is allowed to be released in 2015, but the plan is in 2019, we will start a feasibility study. And in 2021, we'll start the design and pre-development. In 2024, we'll start the construction. Don't know how long it's going to take. So we don't know how long it's going to take, but we know it's going to take a couple of years at least, right? So meanwhile, the residents and the business owner are still at risk. If another stone hit, there's really no other way. We were allowed $230 million. The estimated cost for the feasibility study is going to be about 18, designed for 52 million, and the remaining portion, $160 million. It's supposed to go for land acquisition and construction. You all know about Hoboken. 
One apartment can cost multiple million dollars. So how far will 160 million dollar go? I don't have an answer. And I don't think anybody has an answer now. So we're just going to leave it there. And by the time this construction starts in 2024, the $230 million probably is not $230 million anymore because of inflation. So we don't know whether there's going to be fun, enough funds to actually complete a project. It's a big unknown to us. And we all know that there's going to be a delay for any type of large-scale project like this. So no one knows when the project can actually start or finish. Well, New Meadowland Project is the second project I selected as a winner for Rebuild by Design. It has the last money, $150 million, and the plan is to build a burn around the whole Meadowland section against any tidal wave. Um, and then plus, we plan to put in public transportation and some recreational area. So, Luckily, the Meadowland was chosen by New Jersey government to enter one hot competition to get additional money to actually complete the project. Um, the whole plan, the whole proposal now is at $326 million. The title is Revitalization Through Regional Resilience. Great title. Um, including, first, try to expand existing burn, so against any of the tidal wave. Currently, the burn is supposed to be at five feet, which is under an ideal, everything is good situation. However, the burn has not been under maintenance by town or county. So a lot of places, the burn has been damaged. Some places was as low as two feet only. Sandy at that area was up at nine feet. So you can see water just go over. And now you need to build a burn for 15 feet in order to, you know, counter, you know, act, counting in all the future sea level rise and the extreme stony depth. So 15 is what we are talking about. So 236 million for building the burn and build pumping station to pump the water out if there are flooding situations. So think about, it's an empty fish tank. If you have a little fish bowl in front of you, and that's where we call it the metal lamp. And that glass surrounding, make up the fish tank, is the burn. If rain even came down, water doesn't leave that little fish bowl. So pumping station is to pump the water out from the glass bowl outside when the water is coming from the sky. And of course, that glass bowl is to keep the tidal surge outside so the water won't come in. So pumping station really is necessary if we are putting physical structure <coughs> to stop water from coming in and also <coughs> stop water from leaving the area. Without pumping station, without pumping water out, rainwater is just going to accumulate inside. Okay, wetland restoration, water control structure, a couple other things that's built in here. The price tag is three, what, 236 million. Put in public transportation, 75. Build some toolkits to actually do modeling and things like that, another five. Regional planning grants, another 10. I'm saying it as another 10, another five because number like that to me it doesn't even make sense anymore. Don't know about you, but I certainly don't call my money as million. All right, $150 million coming from Build by Design, and the rest hopefully coming from HUB. We don't know yet because it's still pending. It has not been approved yet, so we do not know if the money is going to come. But even if it got approved, this is the timeline we're looking for. Construction finished by 2022. Again, we all know it's going to delay because huge construction that size always delay. All right, meanwhile, same question, same comment. Residents and business owners still at risk. <coughs> and 326 million, although that is an unimaginable number for me, might not be sufficient if you consider land acquisition if you consider all the work that has to be put into it. 
The universities in the New Jersey, right after sending, were charged by New Jersey DEP to study, to identify solution to prevent another devastating storm event. Um, including those area, Hudson, Hackensett, Arthur Kill, Bunaga Bay, and Delaware Bay. Great idea, because we from the university really will be able to you know, give some small idea, because we are all intelligent professors, right? And we went into some issues that intelligent professors really don't have an answer for. For example, as simple as, why don't people maintain their stormwater drainage system? If you know the storm will be coming and you don't want flooding, isn't that a simple solution? Just make sure that your stormwater drainage system actually work, like not stuck by the sediment? Well, or the other thing would be if your tie gate is broken, wouldn't you simply just fix the tie gate so you can keep the tie water out? It's really not a question that requires a university professor to identify. I guess anybody can do it. We should just hire you guys to do it, right? Because so it's that easy, simple solution. However, decades and decades of lack of maintenance really has prevented the city to be able to let go of the water back into the ocean and the water accumulate at the side. So after Sandy, a couple weeks later, they still have water inundation at that low-lying area. Well, but in addition to maintenance issue, we also identify some other issue. Repetitive flooding. We see the insurance record. A house had five, six claims within the past <coughs> two decades. Again, it doesn't need professor to tell you this. If your house got flooded six times during the past 20 years, wouldn't you want to move? Okay. Well, emergency alert system, emergency response system, how do you activate people? How do you let people know a stone is coming? You better do something. Those were missing. So we identified quite a long list. And some of the items seem to be very straightforward and can be fixed with very low technique. It all comes down to the cost. <coughs> Unfortunately, there is just no money to actually get everything done. The township there are considered middle to <coughs> low income level. So with middle to low income level, with a huge population of immigrants and elderly, they don't have the capacity to actually do all those by themselves. So it is necessary for federal and state to come in to help with the situation. Well, in addition to the state, the federal also help, uh, not just provide money, do work. FEMA had a couple of initiatives. Number one, revise the flood map. The flood map of New Jersey was done like back in the 1980s. So with sea level rise that we just talked about, of course, it's not good anymore. It has to be updated. So FEMA is currently working on updating all the flood map, and they hope to finish the job by 2017. So if you look on the right hand side, it's an example of a flood map. So any of your house, your property, or even school will be mapped just like something like this on the screen. So you have like shaded area, um, it has darker area, and it has area that blank, no color. So if you live in an area that's you know, blank, no color, you are in zone C, which has the minimal flood hazard. You don't have to worry too much. But if you live in one of those darker areas, you are in zone A, which means that you are within what we call 1% chance of getting flooded anyway. What does that mean? 1% of chance you might get flooded. We, we don't know when the next storm is going to hit. So it's a statistic based on the past occurrence. And we decided that area is 1%. <coughs> or if you are in zone B, the area might get flooded every 500 years. But it is not an actual observation. It is statistic based on model and statistic. So do we really know it's 1% of chance? No, we don't, all right? So the other thing is FEMA tried to 
revise the national flood insurance program. And using the flood map, they tried to establish a new program, which again used model and statistic. So if you happen to be in that dark gray area at the bottom, but your house is on top of the hill, you still might be within the flood zone, the zone C. Although you are on top of the hill, your house will never get flooded statistic and it has a lot to do with the scale that they created the map. Uh, so a lot of homeowners complain about it. They are within the flood zone although they never got flooded but now because that flood insurance rate map that FEMA created with a, some people were saying that with a $200,000 house they ended up had to pay $6,400 uh, $6, a year for flood insurance. So the number, it just doesn't seem right. And people are complaining about the accuracy. <coughs> well, there's very little that we could do about it because nationwide, if you want to revise the flood map, you have to have some way to do it. So a lot of homeowners decided against buying the flood insurance because of the new flood rate. Not really a good idea. In the past, they might be able to afford it. Now they don't have any protection, any insurance protection at all. Um, very iffy situation, if you ask me. So this is a photo right after Sandy. Look at those houses. Don't I look funny? It's all the same under that got, got flow away, so they don't have any sand anymore under that. Well, sands on the beach act as, um, actually absorb the wave energy. So when wave hit the sand, sand is there as a barrier to protect us, protect the property. Wave will wash away the sand. That's how we got beach erosion. We don't want our house look like that, and we want a beach. And so another very important reason is we do need to add a scene to the system to create what we call the beach profile. You know, you go swimming, you want to see your beach gradually go into the ocean. Not a cliff, but slow, slow. You want that. You want sand dew, and you want vegetation. You want great habitat for wildlife. Unfortunately, when some hits, it created this huge energy to take away all the sand, to create those beach erosion. So we no longer have beautiful beach. We no longer have the sand to absorb the wave energy. So this program that we call beach replenishment or nourishment has been going on. And has been going on for decades. We have always been doing this. The most economic way is not to try for sand from somewhere else by truck to the beach. The most economic way is actually to get the sand from the ocean. So like the one on the photo, um, <coughs> they will dredge the ocean floor, bring up the, the slurry, and jet them onto the beach. And that's how they bring the scene from the bottom of the ocean onto the beach. Good idea? Bad idea? What do you think? We definitely are destroying some habitat, aren't we? The ocean floor, we're disturbing the ocean floor by doing so. So we might you know, run out of a suitable place to get sand eventually. So the whole uh, New Jersey Geological Survey has been very busy because we need a lot of sand every year. So they have been busy trying to identify location that's suitable to get sand. Uh, big job, necessary. The reason is we need a lot of sand. Let me give you an example of how much sand that we actually need. The Long, Beach, Long Branch to Lock Harbor in New Jersey is roughly, well, how long was that? 1.6 mile. So for 1.6 mile along the beach, uh, now after Sandy, we have about no sand to about 20 feet. Ideally, we want the beach to have about 100 feet. So we need a lot of sand to make that happen. <coughs> how much? Two phases are actually in planning. Phase one only will dump 1.4 million cubic yards of sand. To give you a visual, that's equal to about 140,000 truckloads of sand. So that much sand is needed for 1.6 mile of beach. And that costs about $38.2 <coughs> million. 
this is happening actually. Gao Puro is about to start. And in Jersey, all those uh, beach replenishment will be able to get the federal assistance. The federal will actually provide about 50% of the cost share. So the state and the local community have to come up with another 50%. So I just throw you a price tag of $38.4 million with that phase one project. You can imagine how much money we need to continue this project. Jersey has this shoreline protection fund, and that budget is about $50 million a year, and that budget do nothing else but to help do the matching for the beach replenishment project. Why are we doing this? Because tourism is the second largest economy in the state of New Jersey. <coughs> Without it, we're not going to have that money coming in. What, $40 million a year, we say? So tourism, $40 billion industry. Without the beach, it won't happen. Jersey has a 127-mile coastline. Do a little mass, 1.6 miles is going to cost $38.4 million. And sand has been washing away gradually. Every three to five years, it has to be done again. So every three to five years, this money and this effort has to be repeated. And tons and tons of sand has to be dredged, pumped up from the ocean floor. Over the last 30 years, New Jersey has already spent about $800 million on sand replenishment. Well, that's equivalent to about 80 million cubic yards of sand, or about 8 million truckload of sand. Again, those sand are mostly coming from the ocean floor. So naturally, the whole East Coast is subsiding into the sea and the sea level is rising. We already mentioned that. So we know that we are losing our beach into the ocean. And we are doing the same replenishment. Really, we are fighting the natural. Should we simply retreat from the coast, not bother, let natural happen, naturally? Or should we continue fight the natural and keep the economy, $40 billion, into New Jersey every year. Are we really doing that to create habitat for wildlife, for you know natural habitat, for biodiversity? Or are we really just doing that for one sole purpose of the economy? I'm going to save that question for later when my good friend um, Dr. Thomas is going to join us later. Now all the post-Sandy effort, we are moving away from what we call the recover and repair stage. We are moving toward what we say, get ready, be resilient, be strong against the next event. So what we're trying to do is really to build community that are weather ready, climate resilient. What does it mean by resilient? The definition of resiliency here vary from you know who you talk to. But in my opinion, resilience really means that human, human needs should be met without further degrading the ecosystem. So if we want more sand, by pumping more sand from the ocean floor, degrading the ocean ecosystem, is that resilient? We should limit human footprint to successfully meet the sustainable sustainability criteria, not keep consuming more and more resources, not cause more damage. Everything should have a balance <coughs> if we don't want to tip the points. We've got to pay attention to economic growth versus environmental protection. We want the beach, we want the tourism, we want the economy. But at the same time, we also want to try to provide natural habitat for animals. Uh, we also want to protect our ocean environment. <coughs> Urban development versus habitat preservation. Well, 
I will stop here. I will let Dr. Thomas to give you his two cents. Let's welcome Dr. Thomas. My name is Bill Thomas. I've worked for Montclair also. I'm the director of the School of Conservation. I'm an anthropologist, so I tend to look at these problems from a social political um, angle, not so much from the science angle, because in my opinion, it's not the science that's holding us back, it's the politics and cultural changes that we'll have to make to make these things work. So when I'm approaching conservation, I try to first of all make it accessible to people. What does this mean to you? And then what are we going to have to do to make it happen? So if you're looking at, you know, I think if you take May uh, figures at face value, the $40 billion industry is supported by tourism. It's one of every six jobs in the state. It's 500,000 people living. I don't think there's any way we're going to decide to retreat from the shore. We may not have a choice. Ultimately, Mother Nature may bat last year and move us off the shore. But, and if you look at these numbers, I think you should be a little, uh, I don't say, skeptical in that these are scientists and they tend to be um, conservative. For example, if you look at the literature on carbon and population and the crisis that was supposed to uh, happen with when all these things came together, 2050 was the date everyone was shooting for. 2050, the Arctic was going to open up. There would be no more ice and be able to go across Canada. Oops, and this is by 45 years. It's already happened. So all these numbers are our our best guess, our best shot right now. But as people who live here, you have to make decisions in real time with real money in your lives. Many of these things are moving at a pace that uh, you may not be able to keep up with. As many have pointed out, with the planning stage of the product uh, in Hoboken, by the time they get the plans together, they may not be any good anymore because you know, what we think going to happen may have exceeded in our expectations. So for example, when we talk about uh, what's it mean to you that the, the, the water's going to run? Well, you saw seaside ice in the purple. But if you actually live at the shore, that means right now you have about 80 days a year where you have nuisance flooding. That as you go out to get your car, you have to wade into it because the water's come up through the sewers. They figure by 2100, that would be 240 days a year. 240 days a year, you will wait to your car at some time during the day. If you're in Sandy Hook, you'll be underwater every other day. That's nice, right? So you just paid 400 grand for that place in Sandy Hook, and you have to keep a boat tied to the front post to get in and out. But I think it's clear we're not leaving. Now, at the same time, if you, you know, think a little bit about Miami Beach, these numbers are real. That's Atlantis. We'll actually be able to save them to Atlantis. This is going to be underwater. And if history tells us anything, these numbers are conservative. So you may get to see it way before 2020. Miami Beach will no longer be a playground. It'll be empty. And can you imagine the chaos that will ensue? So for me, part of the, the issue here is to try to make these things real to folks so that you have the information that's necessary to make a decision based you know, on your lives. What we found in other parts of the world, my, my work is typically in the beginning, but when you look around the world, what you find is that people will make good decisions if they're empowered and they have information that you know, gives them the opportunity to make decisions and a government that wants to work with them. Um, right now, I don't think we're there in New Jersey. Uh, for example, most of us don't have any idea of where the water's going to be in the next few years. We don't have flood maps that are current, partly because of the social political process. 1983 maps are no longer uh, like, you know, state of the art, but the maps that have been developed are, on, are constantly under contention because people, of course, will have to make economic changes in their lives based on these maps. For example, as May had mentioned, if you are at base flood elevation now, if your flood insurance, I believe, the number, I, I talked to some folks, that, I, I used to be the city manager of Beckman, New Jersey, which if you know Monopoly, is Atlantic City, Beckman, Margate, Longford. So I dealt with these issues. Um, right now they're looking at $7,000 a year in flood insurance on top of your homeowner's insurance for a house. And the whole place is at sea level, so that's every house, you know, base $300,000 short house, two bedroom bungalow, you just add $7,000 a year 
if you raise it to four feet above uh, base flood elevation, your insurance goes down to 500. So there's a real number for you as a homeowner. You pay $500 a year if you can raise your house. Well, how far do you have to raise your house? Right now, that raising your house will cost you $70,000. And it's, you know, with negative people in the real world, you know that $70,000 is hard to come up with. And now you're borrowing money against the house that may have just been flooded. Or maybe it's no longer worth if you know what the economy's done. That $300,000 house cannot be sold today for $300,000. So these are real problems when you come to someone and say, hey, we would like you to do this in order to be able to stay at the beach. Well, where do I come up with $70,000? It's going to be a government program. And I know, even though you guys probably aren't the news junkies that I am, the government has not been forthcoming with money for anything in the last few years. Right? So your parents or your ability to raise your house will meet these challenges is really severely impacted by the social political process. And, of course, you can change that. That's the great thing. You guys have the power to go out and actually change what's happening. So, but let's get back to the, to the issues at hand. Like we want to know... Or what does this mean to the average general? Well, right now it means if we're going to stay, we're going to have to raise our houses. We're going to have to deal with temporary flood. And what's that look like on a daily basis? Has anybody here been to Hatters or Cape Hatters? All right. Well, that means when it floods, you leave. Everybody's house is 15 to 20 feet in the air, and they just leave the island. Well, can you imagine <coughs> trying to leave these places? Hatters is sparsely populated. It's a lovely place. It's full of dune ecosystems and raised homes. Atlantic City is not. Atlantic City is hard infrastructure, cement, housing projects, and casinos. If you have to get off the island, most of the roads go underwater in the floods. So you can swim, or there's one road that will get you off that island in an emergency. <coughs> one road. Well, there's 11,000 people that live in Becca, another 8,000 residents in Market. There's, 11, there's a thousand buses that come to Atlantic City every day. Should they get caught there? How would anybody do that? It's physically impossible. Now we can fix that, right? All you need to do is build a new road, it's a million dollars a month. So these, again, go back to, do we have the courage to stay? Do we have, are we going to, this $38 billion industry that you and I support and need, for example, if we lose this industry, we figure that it'll be $1,400 per household and extra tax dollars are left make up the difference. Well, it looks like daily flooding in Atlantic City is going to require an infrastructure improvement. They lost 40% of the tax base in the 2009 uh, recession. They lost some more with the flooding. And we're now looking to you to help us get out of that is, uh, problem. The problem, of course, being how much are we going to invest to stay the shore? And, and I think you can see that this isn't going to get better. We spend right now 100, we spend $35 million a year in Atlantic County alone to quench the beach and get all the wash away. Now, I, think that's, uh, I had a personal experience in building the dunes there in 1999, where I, I was telling you before, I was called every name in the book on the radio because I was the advocate, one of the advocates for the dunes. I convinced the guys who I worked for to put them in, and all we saw the boardwalk. Right? $10 million for a boardwalk in that. Put the dune system in. We didn't, we didn't spend very much money. The, the uh, government put it in for us, the federal government. And for that, after saying they didn't have to replace a $10 million item. Well, right now, if you go on the paper, you'll recognize that Margate, the next town down, is resistant to putting those dunes in. Which means if there is a storm, that storm will cut away the dunes that are there. They won't act as a wall anymore. They'll just wither them away and then it'll wash over the town. Um, they're doing that because they can. They're got enough money to fight uh, the government, it's going to ruin their view. It's going to make walking to the beach a lot harder. And that sounds pretty petty, right? When you're talking about millions of dollars that we're going to come back and ask you for once the property's destroyed. Because, of course, no one's going to be able to fix these homes on their own. However, the folks behind this, and that's personal experience, don't worry about insurance. They have enough money to replace their son home without insurance. So for the, you know, most of us live in homes where it's the most precious item we'll ever have, and we spend every dime we have to keep it, right? This is some place they go for 10 weeks a year. It's worth a half million bucks, but you know what? If it's gone, I'll pay another one. It's very hard to do <laughs> politics with folks like this. It's hard to talk to them because they have the same votes you do, except they have enormous access to government. So 
Um, so I, I say these things because when we talk about, we didn't get here talking about sustainability. We didn't talk about resilience. All this stuff was not built, and all of our lives were not built from worrying about other organisms or worrying about what tomorrow is. So we worry about today, we take care of our own needs, and the planet looks at the planet. Now we come to you and say, well, we gotta save the rainforest after we've used it up, and those people better get ready to you know, cut their carbon usage after we get done. So the model of you know human behavior and everything else, we're now asking you to change if you want to continue to have the Jersey Shore, if you want to continue to begin to have a sustainable lifestyle. This is a, something that's driven home to us because we live here. But you know, before it happened, nobody gave a second thought to building another casino, to pumping the sand on the Jersey Shore every day. Um, and I guess the reason we, we put these things together now, because this is a point, this is an issue that we're all going to have to deal with. Luckily for me, I'll be dead before it's all over. I won't, you know, I can punt, we punted on many things in my generation, but you don't get to do that. You're not going to have that choice, because you, it's going to happen before 2100. You'll have to make a choice whether you save the jersey, <coughs> whether you put the money into flood mitigation, and whether you uh, are willing to try to build a resilient society, or you're just going to hope the next generation gets to it. Um, as an anthropologist, I can tell you that other decisions, were, other societies may uh, face similar points in their existence, and typically they punt it. And that's why archaeologists have a lot to do, because they want to dig up what's left of the societies. The Mayans, the world's littered with great societies that made similar. Um, we know more now than we've ever known. We have the ability to make decisions from the scientists and the engineers. And <coughs> Other, you know, we know more about the world and we're better able to engineer than we were at any time in history. Whether we'll make those decisions is a social political one that you, even though you may not be an engineer or scientist, will have a stake in, and that's the valid one. So, Vinny, do you want to open up for questions? Anyone have any questions? Yes. Sure. Um, the subtitle to the, the Rising Tide series was something about what we can learn from the Dutch. So what are the similarities and differences between the Netherlands um, and New Jersey, and is there any hope at all of implementing the kind of thing that they did here? Well, you should definitely come to the event next Tuesday. That is going to be a lot of talk about um, how Dachus is also a partner of that Darwin Project for Hoboken, and their vision on how they will do the rebuild by design for Hoboken. There were a couple other talks before this that are more geared toward Dutch experience and how we can use that and apply to New Jersey. But I guess we'll save that for Tuesday. Well, Eric, you want to say something? Just, just a comment on that for, for the Dutch in the Netherlands. I mean, they, they build their flood protection to one to, one to a 10,000 year event, which is apocalyptic, if I'm getting it. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, they started their being sea, under sea level, below sea level, they, they started their flood control system <coughs> building 50 years ago. Right. Um, so there, they look at it as an acute, an acute event, and then doing the design and engineering and mitigation chronically over, over many years to get where they are today. We operate <laughs> on, on acute, and when you look at build by design, uh, you know they are they are they're beautiful, but you have to ask yourself uh, when you look at the competition built by design by the Rockefeller Foundation. Mm -hmm. They are they are beautiful, but are they are they are they functional? You know what I would say too, Mark. I don't think we have any chance of coming close to the Dutch. I mean, just you know, I mean, history tells us <laughs> that you really have to have your act together to make this work. Eric points out the Dutch working on a scale of one in ten thousand year event, and they've already decided there are other places they're going to sacrifice. They're going to let the water come in. Right. We we have and, and you know we were talking about this earlier as an anthropologist. One of the things I try to do is when, when I try a conservation project, I want to work with one ethnic group because they have a you know a cohesiveness that says, well, we're not going to dump the Dutch on that end of Netherlands, but we have not. We don't have a culture that pushes cohesiveness. We're all immigrants, you know, so it's a whole different like, ball game here. And given the political climate, we're not moving, I, in my opinion, we're not moving anywhere near quickly enough. We just can't marshal the forces that we put to going to the moon. 
on something like this. And so, you know, when I'm trying to keep up with what the Dutch are doing, they're always modeling for worst case scenarios. They're, they're making tough political decisions and they're working with local communities so they get by them. Like I just read about them moving, you know, farmers out of an area and keeping some farmers. So some guys won, some guys lost, but the Netherlands got a flood control project. Really? We can't even get the flood maps because everybody's got something to say. And none of them have any science to add. They're just, it's going to get in their pocket. So I don't think we have a chance to tell the truth. Well, in my opinion, there's a lot to do with priorities. So in the U.S., commonly we put the economy out of front of the top agenda. Everything is the economy first. So we are not willing to sacrifice um, economy for other better goods. So for example, when the nuclear issue was brought up, the whole German ship over to non-nuclear power. If they are willing to suffer economic loss over a certain period of time to switch it over, that is a lot of damage that I don't think we will ever have the guts to do so. So we, in my opinion, we don't try to cure the issue. We put a band-aid over it and we move on. We don't really necessarily put another effort into it to really try to go down to the bottom. We fix it and we move on. So, like Bill was saying, make it stronger and starting from the deeper cause is much better than what we are doing today. All right, so on, on an economic level, how long until insurance companies refuse to insure these homes at the shore? Uh, it's already happening. Uh, in 1999, we got <coughs> premiums for city buildings so that were out of this world and uh, being the only tree hugging you know person on city council and i was on city council i was just running the city uh, the, the mayor actually came to me and said this is real isn't it i said yes it is. <laughs> these guys aren't, aren't concerned about their political you know infighting they, they're going to make money on this and so we started to pay more then and um, you know i think you're going to see if if local building codes aren't adopted that require houses. Right now, they tried to they tried after Sandy to adopt uh, building codes that would mean right now you have to be 10 feet above mean high tide. They want to move them along base flood elevation. Of course, base flood elevation is going to change constantly as the Jersey Shore <laughs> subsides and the water comes up. So, people that I know who are in this business are already telling their folks to move above that base, the current base flood, They're like four feet more. But you know what that. Aesthetically, the Jersey Shore looks terrible. You've got these houses that were two-bedroom bungalows that are now you know, 15 feet in the air on green pilings. That said, um, it's already happening, though, because they, you know, they've said 7,000 or 500 is your choice, but you'll need to spend $70,000 to get there. Well, Bill brought up a very important point. So the current FEMA map that they're replacing is based on the sea level current without factor in the projection. So pretty soon, yeah, we really are going to see a gap. And the true flood map is not going to be reflecting the situation anymore. I think, I think if we're going to rebuild something or put money into building something, I don't think we should rebuild what we had before. I think we should build toward um, above and beyond. I mean, it must be if, that. If, if, if you're here, right, and yeah. the water comes in and wipes this all away and you're going to put it back, that's kind of ludicrous. Mm -hmm. I mean, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And it's not. So how about this? How about we go back inland a little bit and build here, raise the level, put up a level, and create a different environment? I don't get much of an argument for this listening. But the problem, of course, was that, it, okay, I'm running back. It's a mile by a mile, all right? One mile wide, one mile wide. 11,000 feet. There's nowhere to move. Okay, well, they, they can't afford to rebuild it, then they're out. And then you do what you want. I completely understand the problem you're going to run into is when Representative Lobiondo meets with the people who have half a million dollar summer homes or five million dollar summer homes, and he meets with you, your logic just doesn't sway. Mm -hmm. so they send a lot more money than the new that was, You know, straight paper. You're right. Not going to happen. Use the example of Hoboken um, we mentioned earlier. 
why are we spending hundreds of millions of dollars to build a protection silo for Hoboken? Well, we think the area should really just be eBay. We are fighting over the land of the environment, the ocean. But the house is expensive. We don't really have that much money to really buy out all the homeowners. That's number one. And after all, we are the home of free. Everyone has freedom, and we can't really force people to sell their house to the state. So the buyout program is by voluntary. If you want to let the state buy your house, the state has a buyout plan to buy your house. But the state cannot go to you and force you to sell your house. So again, there's really limited uh, things that the state has economic power, monetary power, or you know, public power to do. The one thing I would say, though, in, in defense of your idea is that we used to do these things. When we built the interstate highway system, nobody asked anybody for anything else. How would you want to move? You moved. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we used to do these things. But we've, we've lost our political courage to do that kind of stuff. But I, you know, I grew up in the Midwest and built the internet in the state highways. People moved. Of course, none of them had beachfront million dollar homes either. They were built town homes, you know, that you could buy for $10,000. But mm -hmm. we used to have the courage to do this. We used to have the courage to save people. And as Americans, we said, well, we've got interstate highways. You know, this is for the greater good, but we've lost that. Further along that line, when did the ethos yeah, change? Speak louder. Sorry, I'm sorry. When did the ethos change for that? That it stopped being about we and it's about you know me and individuals, etc. Yeah, that's my kind. Of, uh, honestly, I think the '70s were the beginning of a lot of this. You know, as the sort of the counterculture. I'm a product of uh, revolution against sort of. You know, Morris didn't make any sense anymore. We know a lot of the things that happened in the 70s were for the greater good in the sense of, uh, you know, the Voting Rights Act in the 60s begins to, we begin to see the fruition of these things, women's rights, equal rights for all people. Uh, and, you know, and just sort of dropping that we versus them. Government wasn't working for everybody. But I think we've kind of swung, you know, the penalty swung and have been co-opted by folks who can, you know, uh, the, the small government guys, for example, have co-opted this to mean that you know, government doesn't work at all anymore, and that it's all you know it's all us. We should get it done, take care of things. Mm -hmm. Versus you know my parents' generation, who were products of poverty and then the Great Depression and World War II, saw that there was a greater good through Social Security and those <coughs> programs that are now they're always trying to sell you guys. It's going to you know you get or get out of it, get your money into the stock market, and that sort of thing, because, of course, you haven't experienced the crash that wiped you out. You haven't grown up in absolute, well, I shouldn't say that, but the kind of poverty my parents grew up in, I never had the experience, so it's easier to sell me that I'm not going to need these things. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. we know our culture is very individualistic to begin with, and once you start to, to question authority, period, and the ability of government, I think we've had like a 40-year run now of that, and we're up against it. It took one more crash, and people started to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we need a better safety net, and it's going to take a while to build that. Well, one example is Little Ferry. Uh, Little Ferry is a community that started back in the 60s. So most people who now live in Little Ferry are people who are elderly and already retired. So their biggest asset are their houses. I would suggest that everyone should move out of Little Ferry because the place will be entirely flooded with three feet of water. The whole entire town, except like one small area, is all flooded. So if 90% of the town is going to be flooded with three feet of water, should we rebuild versus should we just ask everybody to evade? But the elderly, like I say, retired community, they don't have any economic power. Their houses will not be sold because no one's going to buy it. And that's the biggest asset, the greatest asset they have. They have no choices. They really can just move away. So we can force people to go. New Jersey, yes, has the buyout program if you want to sell to stay. But it's on 19 cents per dollar. 
if you are one of the residents who is already a retired age, living in your family house that you own for the past 40 years, would you sell your only greatest essay, 19 cents to a dollar to this day? Probably not. So people are stuck, not because they don't want to move away. They might not have the ability, they might not be capable to do so. It doesn't sound like it's a it doesn't sound like it's just a New Jersey problem. Either. You know, it's an ethical problem. And I think maybe the federal government should step in. And I do believe that these people should be evacuated. It's kind of like when you watch those um, those tornadoes that go through Tornado Alley. You know, all the trailers and everybody's wiped out. There's dogs in the tree, and they're like, "I'm a new home," you know. And then we put in new trailers, and these people move right back into Tornado Alley. But I understand, you know, what's going on here. You don't want to throw out the baby with the bathroom. Because if you do that, then there's no shore. Mm -hmm. I need that. that. So if, I think if you're going to make a proposal to make a change that is going to satisfy everyone, it needs to be a new solution, something different than what's been proposed. Maybe moving the shore to a different location. You, I don't know if you remember this, but the administration, <coughs> people on the Mississippi flood plan. You know, it's because, again, growing up in the Midwest, like you said, you know, you just got flooded. Back in. Just, hey, that's amazing sense. So they paid to move out, and a lot of people did move out of the Mississippi flood plan, but it took a flood. It took out a lot of the major towns on the Mississippi. But what you're suggesting happened once in my lifetime, and it can work, and, it, you know, it does make sense. I think one of the things, this is a reality shot, right? The House representative, the representative for, I believe this is part of the state, but I know my part, Sussex County, voted against San Diego. Huh? Okay. I, I mean, you know, reality check, right? Here's a guy that got reelected in New Jersey. And he didn't have to bring any pork off, he just voted against David for his own people. Wow. That's like, holy smokes. Okay, he got reelected. So, any realistic ideas, with, you know, Common sense and that stuff, that's off the board right now. <laughs> it might come back. I mean, like I say, the current administration to move people out of the Mississippi floodplain was very successful. And you haven't seen those stories, you know, because as you know, Tornado Alley is much wider, much bigger than the Mississippi floodplain. So it was doable, they did it, and it's kind of Well, if we want to do acre program more, the ratio has to be adjusted. No one's going to sell their house with such a horrible ratio. It has to be close to the actual true value of the property. However, if you factor in how many houses in the town and their property yeah. value, that's a huge amount of money. And where is that going to come from? Even the $3 billion that was thrown over to Jersey, it will be divided and it will disappear in no time. So although the Blue Acre program has roughly, I, I can't really recall exactly, but it was tens of millions of dollars. But when you divide it down to the property value, there is not that many that can be purchased. Um, I want to go back to that uh, Margate example that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So a lot of towns, especially the uh, beachfront property owners, I read a couple of these contracts that, uh, <coughs> that the state and, um, and I guess the Army Corps was involved in it, uh, they sent out. And I don't necessarily think it's exactly the variable of uh, losing the aesthetic view, more so than how it was written, because there was a lot of this like <coughs> underlying um, uh, yeah, domain type issues. But yeah, um, basically taking property essentially um, from these owners, and so a loss of uh, their privacy was one of the big factors. Also, you know, uh, kind of opening up their um, their property to the public. I know it's kind of a win-win, obviously, for the state. They're the one that's um, investing in it, so they should be able to get that return, <coughs> but that's also at a loss to the homeowner as well. well one thing I, I would tell you, good market, I think that's more in North Jersey, because yeah, the yeah. way it's set up in North Jersey, you walk across properties to get to the beach. Marty gives street ends. Oh, there are street ends. It's all street ends. So it's not quite the issue, but I get, I get where you're coming from, and, but those are things that can be worked out, right? I mean, you can compensate people. I just, it just, you know, again, come from the Midwest, I've never overcome the house issue. I grew up in a house about 
Yeah, it's not more than fifty years ago now. But you know, my parents we sold their house for fifty thousand dollars and it's turned fifty, and that was five years ago. So you know, you come here and somebody gets this kind of money, and they have an inordinate amount of power to you know. Again, when they come to Ohio for their their hurricane assistance, they like to see that they did everything that they can do because, as you point out, we've got people that live in trailers that get wiped out every year. Uh, through no far there, and they can't buy their way out. It's not their second home. We're not even asking them to put the dudes up. It's just got a little candy. Okay. Too much to ask. All right, I get it. I get it. But we're all in this together. Yeah. So, but I understand the issues, and that in Margate's case, it's all street lights. Okay. So, so it's all public yeah. property. And, and, I, and just an anecdote, because I had to keep the boardwalk. Margate's boardwalk. In, if you ever go to Longford, the last town, it stops at number ten. Street 10. Because the other 10 blocks were wiped out in the 62 school. And they're still there, but they're on the way to Ocean City, they're in the water. They forgot all this. The boardwalk used to run all the way to Longport. It's gone. And the good citizens of Longport and Margate decided not to replace it because it was too much of a maintenance problem. Yet they have a lot to say about the Atlantic City boardwalk because they know they're there. So there's somebody who was stuck with these guys. What's that? They're the smart ones. Yeah, the smart ones, that's right. There's a guy, you know, because we've got talk radio and the internet and everything, and somebody who had to take the arrows, the slings and arrows, and these characters worried about the boardwalk they didn't pay for. After a while, I've lost patience with the folks down here. But I can say, in 1962, there were 10 more blocks along they're there, but they're underwater. Yeah, that happened in a couple of years. Yeah, well, if you know Long Beach Island, there was a, a destroyer that washed right through Long Beach Island. Yeah. It's a beautiful picture, but and that destroyer was out at sea. I was going to say, uh, you know, just going back to history, whenever we wanted someone to move from a foreign piece of real estate that we wanted to play with, we would always give them someplace else to go. I mean, the, the state has land that belongs to the state and it could be appropriated for those people to move to that location, you know, and uh, contracts could be made where they could get uh, a discount on the rebuild of the home in a safer location. Well, I assume though earlier that... Because of the Indians, they moved, they had to move, they had no choice. You got to move, you can't have this now. There, there was a car case that just happened. Uh, one homeowner actually lost the ocean view because of the sand. So the town had to replenish the sand and rebuild the seawall. So the homeowners lost the view. Well, the sea, the seawall and the seawall, they would protect that house. But the homeowner were not happy about losing the view, so they sued the town. And they won. And the town had to pay them like amazing $68,000 for the loss of you. So if you look at this kind of cases, I am not really sure there's still a logic there. And well, then when they get drowned out or covered in a landslide, you have a nice little letter that they signed that said you had the opportunity to move. I think what's happened, the stuff you brought up earlier, insurance companies are going to drive this pretty quickly. They will no longer insure homes. Insurance will be so you know, high. But, and in the market will work. It's going to be ugly, but both folks in Little Ferry, they can't, if they can't insure their home and the state only give 19 cents on the dollar, it's going to be ugly. But that's, if anybody's a free market advocate, that's how it's going to work. The problem with the beachfront stuff is folks have enough money to go out and sorry, I'll still go back to this. Are they working on the uh, high philosophy blood tests? Like, uh, so kind of, I guess, you know, seaward side Because I know that, I mean, obviously there's... Uh, right now, the Atlantic City the food stuff has stopped. Because no. they're waiting, the Atlantic County's doing that project have stopped. No, I'm saying as far as an insurance uh, point of view, are they looking at... I know, I know that on the uh, FEMA map, there's a uh, high loss. I think everybody's waiting for the final, they're going to do the final numbers when they find out to find this. Because I guess that will obviously change the opinion too, right? Absolutely. One of the problems they have is when they have guys who have one bunch of money, they, they, can, they can avoid the stuff. But the, you know, in total, I think more and more people will begin to, you know, eventually, obviously, there's not going to be anything they do. That one guy's not going to want to stay there. Those, those 10 rich jerks that want to live right there, when there's nobody else there to, to show off all their money to, you 
Yeah, I mean, we probably all remember the TV slot where there's, there's this big slogan and a smiling politician saying, "Strong New Jersey, stronger than the storm." You know, how long is that going to be true for? And due to the total lack of comprehensive statewide policy to protect people living on the coast. That's what it seems to the message of tonight seems to be, right? That there's no comprehensive plan, that you're on your own. Um, so, you know, and, and as you said, um, well, you know, these are conservative estimates. Um, we haven't talked about the rise in, uh, in sea surface temperatures, which will drive stronger you know, storm events as well. So, um, yeah. some people think there's 70 years worth of sea level rise baked into the system. Right. You know, and they're on, they're up. Uh, fringe, but of course. Sure, I know. Might I mean, be right. <laughs> take Virginia. I think I believe in Virginia at one point. And I'm not sure if this is still true, but um, they were forbidden from talk, from considering, you know, any acceleration in sea level rise. Right? Or even mentioning it as the water sort of lapped onto the shore of, uh, onto the streets. You know, um, crazy. Um, yeah. Are we at that point in New Jersey, or or well, beyond yeah. it? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I think we're beyond it. Of course, they had a plan in 2009, never got ratified. Right. Right, we used to have an office of climate or something yes. or other, right? And that yeah, was that, that one spoke of kind of look at our solar project, right? We were supposed to add, we would have like $8 million in capital funds for the university. See, Sam, right now, I didn't do that to wear out the pencils, you know? Mm -hmm. But the governor wore out a pencil, took it right off the mark, and I right. you had to make $100,000 all these years instead of $8 million. But, uh, yeah, I, you know, personally, I just think that until Fox News hires this fuck guy or, <laughs> he, you know, or he becomes president, we're not going to see any action in what I, you know, um, I'm still involved with folks down where I used to work because, you know, there's not that much, I hate to say it, brain power in the government, you know, so that even guys like me still get it. Well, if you need any big wigs, can you tell them, please, please, save Atlantic City? Um, for <laughs> some obvious reasons, but also it's got the only five, you know, sizable wind turbines from which I buy electricity, you know, in the whole state, right? I think we have five, count them. And that's where they live, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, we got to say Atlantic City. Got to say some. Well, they're trying to, but you know, the politics in Atlantic City seven out of the last ten mayors went to jail. So <laughs> that's a rough spot to get things done. Um, uh, but, but you know, I would say to you that you know these plans. I, you know, when you look at other societies, I'm sure the Mayans were having arguments like this. I'm, you know what I mean? I'm, it, it, we just we're going to keep farming, farm harder, farm do this, do what we do. Yeah, but it's not working. It's not raining. Yeah. It's the same story here. We're, we keep grinding the same thing. I think we're making some headway because, again, I mentioned Representative Lobiondo. He actually took a loss in school. And now all of a sudden, things like the Army Corps and this kind of work became very interesting to him. Which, of course, you know, again, we're self-interested creatures, so here we go. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the, the insurance people are going to drive this bus, and they're going to make it much more expensive for folks to live shore unless we do stuff. And if you do go down there now, you see how, you know, a couple houses on every block have been raised. Yeah. Uh, but what I was saying to these guys the other day is that it doesn't matter that these are only two events in your lifetime. You have to plan like this is going to be a normal thing. You have to be ready for the next storm. And this came up because they put the generator on the ground. And, you know, <laughs> the storm's just going to wipe out the generator. So, you know, it's just kind of like, what are you doing? Because we have generators at our school and they can, they're not, they're not fun. On flood level. So, um, you know, they're thinking about these things, but they're making the same old mistakes because we're not doing that, you know, building for the 10,000 year event. We're acting like, well, it's, it's not going to happen for 10,000 years. Who knows if we'll be here? And we had two in a row. They got lucky. We took more from our ring than they did. And Joaquin this last week just beat them. It's going to be, you know, they're going to see more and more of these things, and so they're either going to get on the ball or they're not. But my money's on not. Well, so concerns my ability to force to change the current condition. Some places that the insurance is like one third, the insurance premium is one third of the property value. So homeowner would decide not to purchase bought insurance. So if they got hit, they might have no choice but to move away. So that could be how we're going to rewrite the whole future. But, but to get a mortgage, you have to, you, you will get, you know, you get certified by the has, and you won't be able to get a mortgage unless you carry, unless you pay straight out of the house, unless you carry flood insurance. So you get into areas, I mean, you talk about the coast and the coastal system. But you pay flood insurance here in Montclair, 
at Tony's, you know, when you live off of Tony's Brook, you know, a trip of the Passaic River. And you, if you look at the socioeconomics of, let's say, a middle class existence, let's say Montclair, that on top of the property taxes, you're, you're going to start paying three to seven thousand dollars with these new, with these new, uh, with the new digital maps in 2017. That if your house floods, well, so it's probably High Point, New Jersey, and it doesn't make it. It makes it a a, a bad business proposition to actually own own a home here. Yeah, it was a, in, in my class. Well, this is an excellent point for those PhD students here from the Environmental Management Program. You should really think about it. How do you manage your environment correctly, considering all the socio-economic value here? Consider all the environmental justice problem. And going back, we need a balance. So are we going to really staying at the places we know are going to be hit again by the flooding issue. Are we going to stay there and try to build it back? Or should we just ask people to move away under circumstances that it might be people who can't? How are we going to help people to move away? How are we going to be able to really reshape the whole environmental condition? Those will be big questions for you, our future environmental manager. Thank you very much for being here.